Thank you, Rick. So this is the box I got to stay in right here. I, That's I'll the box. Stand here and share a few thoughts with you. It's good to be here. Uh, this is going to be a quick overview of some concepts around leadership and leadership mentoring. Uh, how many of you were are employed? How many employed groups? Okay. How many nursing nursing leaders? Great. Okay. Hospital uh, administration. Okay, great, wonderful. All right, so uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and give you three slides on my why behind why we're seeing so much complex change and pressure on U.S. healthcare. Talk a little bit about the principles of fair process, and then I, I want to share and introduce a concept that actually I think is potentially one of the most important leadership concepts to get. We can't get into it in great detail in 30 minutes, uh, but I'm going to encourage you to do some reading on technical versus adaptive change if you have not already, and then how do you support your young leaders. Between 1999 and 2012, these are the data for the cost of health insurance for both individuals and families. Cost of coverage for a family in 1999 was 5791 In 2012, the cost of family coverage was 15000 $745 for commercial insurance. To put it in context, if we stay on this path, the cost of family coverage in 2025, which will be here before any of us really want it to be, right, will be $45,000 a year just for commercial health insurance. I was here yesterday where there was a little bit of a dialogue around whether the Affordable Care Act is going to increase health insurance costs. Well, this is the trajectory we're on. This is the trajectory we're on. And uh, I don't have a lot of comments about the ACA, but I'm going to make two statements about the Affordable Care Act. Listen to this, because one of the two will resonate with you more likely th than the other. The first is, there's no way we can afford to expand health insurance coverage in this country unless we get a handle on health care costs. No way we can afford it. Second statement is, there's no way, no way we'll ever get a handle on health care costs unless we get everybody covered. Okay? Now, there's components of truth in both of those statements. There's not one is right and one is wrong. But for the vast majority of us in the room, one of those statements will resonate with you more than the other. And if the first statement resonates with you more than the second, you likely are not a big fan of the ACA. And if the second statement resonates with you more than the first, you are probably more likely to believe in at least the concepts that were included as part of the health insurance reform of the ACA. Uh, this is put another way, same data, 99 to 2012, overall inflation in the, con in the economy, 38%, increase in workers' earnings, 47%, increase in healthcare costs, 172%, increase in out-of-pocket healthcare spending in this country, 180% during the same time period. Uh, this is why for middle-income America and below, their take-home pay is flat or falling. It is us, it is healthcare that is eating away at our country. If we look at total federal spending as a percentage of GDP and look at three different scenarios, between now and 2050, the, last, the lowest line is 0% year-over-year inflation. It's just new people coming into the programs. The middle line is 1% year-over-year inflation. The top line is 2.5% year-over-year inflation until 2050. And I'll just add that we have never held year-over-year -year inflation in these programs to 2.5 percentage points for any period of time since they were enacted. So even the top line is a rosy scenario with no changes in these programs to balance the federal budget in 2050. Uh, the current 10% tax bracket would need to be 26% income tax. It. The middle bracket, 25, would need to go to 66, and the top income tax bracket would need to be 92%. Okay, that's not going to happen in the United States, and that's why healthcare will change. And our leadership question, our leadership challenge is what are we going to do about it? How are we going to engage in the changes that have to take place in healthcare? And how are we going to organize all the different complex discussions and challenges, pressures, hard economic facts, and keep things contained in a way that at the end of the day, we can go home feeling like we've done something to improve the care that our patients are going to get 
and to give this country a more sustainable health care system. John Cotter has spoken a lot about leading change efforts. I actually think the next slide is more informative, which is why transformation efforts fail. Take a look at this list. Just let it soak in for a moment. Uh, we're all going to have our favorites on this list as to why some complex change process, or maybe even some simple, what we thought was going to be a simple change process that we've tried to lead sometime in our career, failed. All right? My favorites are not creating enough of a powerful guiding coalition. What it really means is not having the right stakeholders involved early on in the process. Uh, under communicating by a factor of 10, or sometimes a factor of 100, under communicating, I think, is a key driver of failure. At least it has been in my experience. And uh, not systematic planning for and creating short term wins. All right? One of the challenges with complex transformation efforts is that we may create this vision or where we want to go in three years, all right? But we're not putting the mileposts along the way that are going to help us understand okay, if we want to be there in three years, what needs to be different in 90 days? And what do I need to do this week? so that by the end of this quarter, we will have made progress uh, towards our ultimate goal, all right? Sometimes we create a great vision, we put that light on the hill of where we think we're going, we put the teams together and we have a lot of meetings, right? Lots of meetings. We know how to have meetings in healthcare, okay? And we wake up halfway through our projected timeline of our project and we realize we haven't gotten any real work done. We haven't gotten any real work done other than an awful lot of expensive meetings. Do me a favor next time. Um, next time you have a meeting with your reports, because you'll know what they're paid, just do a little tab of what that costs you, what that meeting costs. Take everybody's salary, boil it down to what that hour or two hour or three hour meeting costs. And maybe your approach uh, to meetings will change. All right, so a quick toolkit of some leadership mentoring ideas, uh, and I don't have time to go into any of them in depth, but I really would encourage you to think about a few items here. The first is fair process. This is a Harvard Business School H, uh, HBR article that I would encourage you to get. Uh, fair process, managing in the knowledge economy. How many of you have read this HBR article? All right, so I would suggest you go back and read it, because it's a good one. And you say, boy, this is really complex stuff, okay? Engagement. Do you actually believe the people that are closest to the problems you're trying to solve often have the best ideas about how to solve them? Do you believe that or not? Okay? If you believe it, then you've got to think about how you're going to approach change. If you don't believe it, I think your ability to manage complex change is going to be limited as a leader. All right? Um, because ultimately, it's the people that are closest to the work that are going to be doing the work that are going to actually make things happen in your ER, in your hospital, in your system. And so engaging them is really critical. Um, the next two steps uh, are around, as you're moving through the process, explaining uh, why certain decisions were made and then making very clear what the expectations are uh, after the decision point. Uh, this is not from the article, but it's by Fisher and Yuri getting to yes. You know, really, honestly, giving people a stake in the outcome uh, is so critical, making sure they participate in the process. Uh, if they're not involved, they are hardly going to support the outcome of the process. And in fact, the process often is the product. We're talking about complex adaptive systems, complex issues where there is no right answer. There's choices among complicated, challenging options. And all of us understand that we don't get to make all the decisions that affect us. Not a single person in this room gets to make all the decisions that are going to affect them. I don't care if you're the CEO of your group. You do not get to make all the decisions that are going to affect you. I'll share some of the decisions that you didn't get to make later when I talk about quality measures and value-based purchasing. All right? So engaging people in the process of trying to understand why we're struggling with this so they feel like you have a vote, at least they have input into the process, even if they aren't the decision maker, they're so much more likely to accept the decision even if they would have made a different one. And that is just a, a critical check-in point as you're moving through various 
projects. So fair process, knowledge, managing in the knowledge economy, go get the article, read it, try to use it. It's amazing how frequently you have to remind yourself to use it. Step back from the decision and say, what's the fair process in making this decision? Critical stuff will lead to much greater engagement and acceptance of the decisions you're making as a leader, even if people would have made a different one. Second quick takeaway, uh, coaching and 360 feedback. How many of you get anonymous 360 surveys done on your work as leaders every year? Okay, I would encourage you to do this. It can be painful, <laughs> but it is incredibly helpful. It is a gift. Um, you are collectively in charge of multi-million dollar operations. Investing in your leadership is really critical. Uh, and I, I was very fortunate in one of my first leadership roles uh, that I had a very supportive organization uh, that helped me uh, develop as a young leader, uh, invested in my leadership, uh, actually was able to go through an assessment, a 360 survey, coaching, and ongoing feedback, and it was really helpful. It is not cheap, although some of your organizations will have internal resources that can do some of these things. And 360 surveys are cheap. They're very cheap. And um, if you want three questions to put on a survey, all right, you can, everybody's going to have their little uh, checkpoint number system. But if you want three questions on a 360 survey that will help you and will help the people that report to you, ask people anonymously from wide range of stakeholders, continue, start, stop. Continue, start, stop. What are the things you're doing as a leader that are working and you should continue to do as a leader because it's helping that organization? Start. What are the things that you're not currently doing that you need to start doing in order to move this organization forward? Stop. What are the things that you are doing today as a leader that are holding us back and you need to either stop or modify the way you're approaching those things? Continue. Start. Stop. It's great. Here's some lovely gifts. 2004. Dr. Asplund does not demonstrate leadership whatsoever, only delegates, never listens to coworkers. This one's a little painful. Poor communicator. At times, Brent appears to look right through me when I am talking to him. I don't believe he knows how our work fits into health partners. Okay? I didn't say it was fun to read, that it was helpful. 2007, Brent has paid remarkable attention to proving his interaction with and receptivity to others' ideas. I appreciate and admire this effort and growth. Now, I will say that both of those were gifts, and, and it really speaks to the fact that most people, there's always an exception, but most people are going to be willing to give you a chance as a leader if they truly think that you are engaged, you have their best interests at heart, you really seriously and honestly think that they are an important stakeholder, not that you're always going to agree. If we always agreed, there wouldn't be, room, there wouldn't be need for a team, right? That's the purpose of having a team. Um, and uh, people are going to be willing to give you a chance as a leader uh, in most cases, but you have to be willing to listen and act on what they're telling you, even when it looks like that bottom paragraph right there, which is not fun to read, okay? So 360 feedback, you know, uh, one advantage of talking to yourself is you know that at least one person is listening, right? <laughs> Active listening is critical. We don't assume that just because someone can see, they can read. So why do we assume that just because someone can hear, they can listen? There's a difference between hearing and listening, all right? And that's what I didn't understand in 2004 because I wasn't actively listening. I knew where I thought we needed to go. I came out of the gate storming at 100 miles an hour, and we just got to do this. Can't you see? Here's the vision. Let's just do this. Well, I didn't understand a lot of things about complex change, and I still have a lot to learn, all right? Uh, but I love that quote. Uh, why do we assume that just because someone can hear, they can listen, all right? Team building. Uh, how many of you have read any of Pat Lencioni's fab fables? These are in every airport bookstore. Hands, Pat Lencioni fans. I actually went to a one-day workshop with him, and I, I thought he was very good. This was uh, about eight or nine years ago. 
Um, and there, there is a series of books that you literally can get done in an hour plane flight. All right, they're, they're leadership fables addressing different things. Five dysfunctions of a CEO, the five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, there's one around leadership, uh, CEOs, and a whole series of them. They all kind of look like this. Um, and he characterizes these dysfunctions of teams and team building. Absence of trust. If you don't trust each other, you'll have the second piece, which is fear of conflict. All right? Lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, inattention to results. Uh, I think it's really those first two pieces, and uh, one of his uh, fables is called Death by Meeting. Okay? And uh, he really characterizes why do you bring teams together for meetings? And really gets into how that team should function in a trusting environment where they're not afraid to have healthy, constructive conflict. Conflict in team meetings can be very good. And in fact, the total absence of conflict almost certainly means you either A, aren't dealing with a complex issue. In other words, you shouldn't have had the meeting in the first place, right? Or B, the real issues are not getting on the table at all, right? So uh, having how to have healthy, constructive conflict in your teams and your groups um, is very challenging, very challenging, because again, um, people are going to bring their own communication biases, they're going to bring their own baggage to the table, right? Um, but that's part of what we have to coach and help as leaders so that people can get to a place where your team can have healthy conflict. Uh, I think that's really critical. Uh, Lencioni wrote all these fables and then last year uh, put kind of the concepts together of what he calls an organizational health. And uh, he has a book out called The Advantage. So uh, if you want to just kind of pull together all the little pieces of Pat Lencioni's work on leadership uh, and organizational health, get the book The Advantage. Again, it's a quick read, not quite as quick as the fables, but really kind of pulls together the various concepts that he's talked about. All right. So little tidbits that we kind of float in here. Fair process. Coaching, 360 feedback, uh, team building, five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, how many of you use the RACI model? When you see it, you may use it uh, for managing. Uh, it's a way, actually, it's a tool to help you implement fair process in your change efforts. All right? Um, and it's not complicated. It's right here. Who's responsible? Who's actually going to go do the work on this? who's accountable for making the decision and owning and having overall accountability for whatever this change initiative or task is, who needs to be consulted, and who can just be informed about the decision after the fact, all right? And it's the last two bullet points that make you think through systematically what's fair process for what we're trying to do here. What's fair process? Um, because if you treat somebody who should have been a C as an I, and you inform them of the wonderful decision that you and your team have made, right? Uh, and they didn't get a, con a chance to consult in that decision, uh, you've just violated fair process. All right, so it's, it's a nice little tool uh, for helping you manage uh, fair process. Okay, uh, my favorite concept of the day. I will tell you that you may not know the framework in this book, Leadership on the Line. You may not use the exact same language, but for those of you who are the most successful leaders in this room, you're doing this. And for those of you who are struggling in your leadership roles, you're not doing this, period. All right? You don't have to use the same language. You don't have to call it exactly the same but you either get this or you don't, and if you don't, you're gonna fail as a leader. You will never get beyond your current role. People don't really resist change, they resist loss, or excuse me, loss. Uh, understanding the difference between technical and adaptive work in leading change is absolutely critical, and if we have anything in spades in healthcare with all the economic pressures and the 
data that I showed you at the beginning of this, uh, we are going to have immense, immense challenges trying to get this healthcare system reorganized, and it's almost all adaptive work. So Brent, what are you talking about? Well, let's start with technical challenges. What's a technical challenge? A technical challenge requires us to implement current know-how to fix. With technical work, you as the leader can actually own it, or some team member that works for you can own the technical work. It's just, we gotta get the job done, right? Uh, an example is improving your ED revenue cycle. All right, uh, going back next week and starting to submit PQRS quality claims, which I'll talk about in an hour, uh, that's a technical challenge. There are rules of the road, there are measures out there. Uh, you have to report it with your billing cycle. Most of you are already doing it uh, in emergency medicine. That is technical work. You as a leader or your finance people in your organization are responsible for going and doing the job. It doesn't require a lot of new thinking. In contrast, adaptive challenges require us to think about new ways of doing things, new attitudes, values, behaviors, performance, and people cannot make that adaptive leap um, without learning those new things. They can't get to where you need to go without changing the way we think about a challenge we face, about changing the way we behave in situations or our systems operate in systems in situations uh, requires adaptive work, all right? Um, who owns and has the challenge of doing this work? In contrast to technical work where you as a leader can kind of take it on, um, the people with the problem own this work uh, because they're the only ones who can change the complex systems. And great examples have been talked about in this, in this, comp in this conference. Redesigning the flow of inpatients from the ED to hospital beds. That's a complex adaptive system uh, and trying to eliminate boarding in your hospital. Sure, there are technical components to it, but that is not a technical challenge. If that was a technical challenge, we wouldn't see boarding all over the country. That's adaptive work, all right? Um, I, one other analogy to try to get this in your head a little bit uh, is I think sometimes in the emergency department, uh, patients come in with an acute injury, say it's a laceration. That's a technical fix. We can take on that problem for that patient and say, I know how to fix this. I'll give you some uh, instructions on how to take care of the wound, but you don't, you don't, I can own the work of fixing your laceration, right? Contrast that with uh, somebody who's now coming in for their third admission with complications from diabetes and chronic disease management. Without a different kind of partnership with that patient, in which they understand that they own the work of managing their chronic disease, diabetes, um, they're never going to get off of the cycle of being readmitted. We can't take that problem from them. They have to own it, all right? Technical and adaptive change. Get this picture in your mind um, because it really is uh, the challenge of orchestrating complex teams through a difficult change process. The lower line of this is the threshold of learning. The upper line is a limit of tolerance. And the key question is, are people productively engaged in your change effort? Are they productively engaged in the work? If it's below the lower line, that means they just don't care enough about your change effort to be productively engaged in it. Don't care. Don't care or don't understand why they should be engaged or don't know about it. People that are above the line are people that are so freaked out about the prospect of what you're saying to them that they disengage. We call it being over the top. Now the quick way uh, to, to talk about this are people, is people, are the people having their heat too low or their heat too high when it comes to your change effort. And trying to keep stakeholders in that productive range is really challenging uh, because people are going to come to it with lots of different perspectives, okay? Uh, even stakeholder groups where you would think there would be at least some uniformity of how they would react to a challenge, there is no uniformity. So if you think about your physician group, your nursing group, 
your hospital administration group, um, and you're talking about the adaptive work of reducing boarding. Uh, you have 25 different physicians. They're going to come at this with lots of different perspectives, and with the same challenging discussion, you'll have people that are below the line, people above the line, and some, hopefully, that are engaged in a productive way with your change. So what, is, what are some examples of adaptive change in healthcare? You know, it's going from what you've always done to innovating. Uh, I am now responsible for an accountable care organization's clinical programs in a 560 provider group, which is really uh, dominated by primary care, uh, and really getting them to think differently about generating and cranking volume to creating value for the populations that we're at risk for is really, really critical. Um, look at the last one here, from filling hospital beds to avoiding readmissions, right? I'm sure that challenge is starting to come right into your wheelhouse uh, with all of the challenges we're talking about. Every one of those things is from, to, from, to, and that implies it's either or. And uh, one of the key principles of adaptive leadership is to get people to the both and. This is a Jim Collins quote. Tyranny of the or pushes people to believe that things must be either A or B, but not both. And instead of being oppressed by this, highly visionary companies liberate themselves with the genius of the and. The ability to embrace both extremes, both examples of a complex problem at the same time. And instead of choosing one or the other, they figure out how to get both or some measure of both of those extremes. Either or and both and thinking. If it's either or, that means there's only one right answer. And um, when you're right, those who disagree with you have to be wrong. Both and, lots of possible answers to these challenges. And when you are right, those who disagree with you could also be right. All right? Um, I think a lot of the debates and grumbling about the Affordable Care Act, uh, it really is true. It's not that there's one right answer and if the people don't agree with you, they're wrong. There's lots of both ends uh, in these complex policy problems. Uh, so we talk about this tension as understanding and managing polarities. All right, A polarity is the presence of two opposing, not necessarily opposite, but two opposing attributes, tendencies, or principles. They're interdependent. They are a relationship that is ongoing and is not going to go away. Uh, and so they have to be managed together. For example, your hospital has to have an operating margin, right? Your hospital has to have an operating margin in order to keep the lights on. And it's true today that they get a much higher margin from some elective surgical cases than they do from some medical admissions coming from the emergency department. So asking them to completely cancel their elective schedule so that we can move our borders into inpatient beds uh, there may be rare occasions when that's correct and the right choice, um, but that's a polarity. Your hospital's got to survive economically, and that polarity and tension is not going away. So helping to partner in ways that uh, understand that is really critical. Different attributes, problem versus polarity. Um, a problem is not ongoing. Polarity is. It's not going to go away. A problem has a definable endpoint. A polarity does not. And uh, there's other things here about having to manage all the alternatives together um, with a polarity. Um, these are other properties of adaptive work. And I, I would love to spend time kind of going through this, doing case studies about what adaptive work really is, because I know that you've all been engaged in it, uh, whether you called it adaptive versus technical work or not. Uh, and uh, it is really, uh, to me, the most rewarding aspect of leadership. And you think about this polarity of holding these two things together. You know, people, this is a quote from Viktor Frankl, people who thrive in difficult times, they do two things. They face reality and they remain hopeful. All right? Facing reality and remaining hopeful. The reality is we have to change our healthcare system or we'll bankrupt the country. Remaining hopeful is you know, we have the tools and we are the right people to help lead these change efforts, all right? And you can see, because you have them in your group, the people that get too far to one end of, the, of this spectrum than the other, all right? 
You we all have a corrosive cynic in your group, right? They're just going to screw us, right? And that's not very helpful for complex change, right? You probably all also have or know of or have worked with someone else who's an irrelevant idealist who's just sort of floating around the room smiling about how everything's going to be great. Also not very helpful. Particularly when you have two of these individuals in the same meeting. That's, that's kind of fun. That's, that's, that's worth uh, the price of admission uh, just to watch, watch them. Um, I have to stop, but I will tell you this. The most common cause of leadership failure the most common cause of leadership failure, and I really mean failure, is treating an adaptive problem or polarity with a technical fix. I have a great idea, you do it. Doesn't work. Well, I appreciate the chance to share a few thoughts with you and be happy to have further dialogue. I uh, don't want to get us behind schedule, but connect people with the why the why behind the work and we will change health care okay so the, the room might groan if Sherry said we were, we're ahead of schedule take a few more minutes they might go oh no <laughs> understand why transformation efforts fail John Cotter all right use fair process and take the racy model as a as a tool to help you check in on who needs to be consulted now who can be informed after the fact Invite 360 feedback. It's a gift. Be willing to act on it. Offer it for the people who report to you. It'll move your teams forward. Build effective teams and understand what the dysfunctions are that are going to make your team less effective in this complex world we're in. And if you really want to drive your system to a different level, I encourage you to get that book. You may decide you're going to use different language than Leadership on the Line, uh, the Heifetz and Litsky book. But understanding when you're in an adaptive problem and you need people to think both and rather than either or, and how to keep them in a productive range, uh, once you reflect on it a little bit, you'll see great leaders and how they do it. You may, not, you may not be able to do it exactly the same, um, but there are people that are so good at this and they're typically the ones that are leading the systems. I'll stop with that. This is another great book. It really talks about what motivates us, what gets us to do the things we're passionate about, and talks a lot about intrinsic motivation. And uh, I, I would encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to read Daniel Pink's book, um, about intrinsic motivation and its autonomy, mastery, and purpose. All right? feeling like we have a stake in the changes that we're faced with, uh, that we really know how to use these systems, and we're doing it for a reason. Yes, quick question. Do you have a, a good... Oh, how to deal with the uh, older generations that are just saying absolutely no to any kind of change, the older folks in your organization? Who... Well, I've seen some young folks who are saying just no, too, so... <laughs> Uh, so the question is, the generational differences and how do you manage uh, various stakeholder groups that are not engaged? I mean, I think um, it is really, and I'm not trying to be trite about this, it's, you come back to that framework. You've got to ask yourself, why is there, is there heat too high or too, too low? And this is why it's, it's actually helpful. Because remember, what you see from a behavior is disengagement. What you observe is disengagement, that they're not really doing the work of, of what you're trying to do. Uh, but sometimes on the surface, unless you probe and try to understand better, uh, someone whose heat's too high looks the same as someone whose heat's too low, because all you see is disengagement. Um, and the worst thing you can do uh, is treat someone as if you're seeing like they don't care what, what you're trying to do as a leader, um, and you assume it's because they just aren't engaged and they just don't think it's important. When in reality, uh, they're scared to death about what changes they're facing because it either hasn't been what they've done for the last 30 years or it didn't feel like this is what I did my residency training for. 
that I just got out of. Uh, this isn't what I signed up for. And they may, may be over the top. And what they might most need from you as a leader uh, are some tools and ways of thinking about that that helps take the pressure off so that they can be engaged. If you treat somebody who's way over the top and too stressed out uh, as someone who just doesn't care, you'll knock them out of your organization. And that may be somebody who really is going to be helpful for your organization to move forward. So I just use this framework. Uh, it's not the answer for everything, but it is a helpful tool. Other comments or questions? All right. Very good. It's a quick tour, uh, but I look forward to talking with you. Thanks again uh, for letting me share a few minutes with you.